Welcome to the Vetiver Vibes podcast. We're your hosts, Nikki Frazier and Rachel Dean, certified clinical aromatherapists. We are excited to have you here on today's episode where you know that you'll get the best essential oil scoop. This episode is brought to you by Essentia, a leading online school for aromatherapy. If you want to learn more about aroma massage, check out the courses at www.schoolofessentia.com. Welcome to this week's episode of Vetiver Vibes. Nikki Fraser here with Elizabeth Guthrie, and we are excited to talk all things about trauma and aromatherapy. It's it's a very fascinating topic that I am very passionate about also. Um, so I'm very excited to have Elizabeth on the podcast today. Uh, Elizabeth Guthrie is a clinical herbalist, certified aromatherapist, and yoga teacher with a PhD in natural medicine with a specialization in naturopathic psychology and a master's of, master's of public health in functional nutrition. They are also the best-selling author of the Trauma-Informed Herbalist and Essential Oils for Trauma Books. She also holds multiple other certifications from conventional and traditional schools. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Yeah. I know I've been taking, I've taken a couple of your classes, so I'm actually going through your trauma and essential oil class right now, um, which I am absolutely loving. I, I went through it the first, well, the last time you offered it and happy to go through it again now and loving the, the add-ons that you've added to it. And uh, I joined partway through your herbalist and trauma one, which I'm still finishing the, some of the last recordings. And I absolutely love that. I'm not as well versed in herbalism versus aromatherapy. Um, but as I have a background as a child and youth care worker, addiction counselor. Um, so, you know, looking at the trauma, I've had a lot of students that I work working in the school system have gone through a lot of trauma and so I love that this is something you're you're sharing about and sharing that information because it is very important. And the world we live in today is just full of trauma. I, I feel like we're in one of the most toxic times of the world and people are feeling it and know, and finally starting to realize how much trauma there is around us and it's affecting us. Um, yeah. So happy to have you on. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that this is one of the more isolating times, if not the most isolating time we've ever been through. So trauma tends to happen when there is a lack of community support, a lack of um, Dr. Peter Levine, who is the man who created uh, somatic experiencing, he actually talks about trauma occurs when there is a lack of compassionate witness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us nowadays, we may be more interconnected online than ever, but just from the nature of our societies, and we tend to not be as connected as people, we tend to not have as strong of a community. And mm -hmm. so we may know a lot more about everybody around us now, because everybody posts everything online. But we don't necessarily have that um, connection that even a generation ago was easier to find. You knew your neighbors better. You, for the most part, people kind of interacted more face to face and more on that personalized level. Absolutely. And, and just the way you said that makes me think of growing up, my parents, we knew all our neighbors, yeah. like everybody. And my parents have been in that house almost 40 years and they yeah. still know, like when people move in, move out, da, 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 like, my, my dad's always out doing yard work, live on a big house, uh, big yard, I should say. And, and it like, we've always known our neighbors, right? I've been in this house for five years. I know their names. I don't know anything else. Um, right. like I don't know my neighbors at all. And, or the house before that, that we lived at for seven years. Like we just don't get out and know people like we used to in person. You're right. Yeah, it um, is. It is amazing how like I was thinking about that the other day because my grandmother was talking to me about a, a house that was a couple of uh, houses down. And she says, it's where the Blackmans used to live. And I was like, yeah, because we know the Blackmans and we know the Legans and we know all the other people around us, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't like I know my neighbors on this side. I know their names. And the neighbors on this side are, are, we know who owns the house and he rents it out to a fraternity every year, but I don't know the kids that are over there right now. And yeah. I know the lady across the street goes to the same church as me and that's it. I don't even know her name. 
So we're very, they're very isolated in many ways. And when we have this isolation, a lot of the times it makes it easier for us to stay in that stress response. We talk about this in class, right? The stress cycle, if it completes, you're less likely to come away with those trauma responses that can be very uncomfortable and very difficult to, to live while you're also experiencing those issues. Um, And so we don't have the compassionate witnesses that we used to have, and therefore it makes it harder to complete that cycle. And while I do think that that's an important thing to consider, and that's an important, you know, piece to the puzzle, right? We need to get back to more of that where we can. In the meantime, what I have found through my experiences is that plant medicine and of course, essential oil, since that's kind of our focus here these things can actually help bridge that gap for our nervous system while we're trying to figure out how to rebuild our communities. Absolutely. I love that. And I know we've dived right in. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I I think because it's like, just, I I can tell your passion when you're talking and teaching about it. um, And it is something that I absolutely love and and am passionate about also. Um, But I want to take one step back and, and, we ask one question to all of our guests, um, and it's it's usually a tough one. Uh, I would love to know, what is your favorite essential oil? Oh, no. So this <laughs> really is something that probably changes based on um, where I am, the things I'm dealing with, what my stress level is. Um, so- I have found that the more that I work with essential oils, the more that I love many of them, depending on what I've got going on right now, I would say it's probably bergamot. Bergamot Mm -hmm. has just been, it comes up over and over again. My little bottle is currently sitting by my chair, like (laughs) where I work. It just sits there right now because that is such a, uh, a a powerful option for me. Um, and then another one that is kind of an overarching that I love is spearmint. Uh, spearmint's not one we use as frequently. We think of peppermint, but kind of the sweeter, um, there's a lot more carvone in spearmint. So it kind of creates a smoother, sweeter mint taste or taste. Mm-hmm. Oh no, smell. <laughs> the smell and taste is so combined for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do not ingest essential oils, guys. So don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But like the the sweet the sweet um, smell of the spearmint is very much a favorite. But yeah, right now bergamot. Awesome, I love that. And I know it's one of those questions that I'm like, I, everyone's always like, "Oh, that's so hard." I'm like, I know, and I wasn't going to let you get away with not answering it either, even though we dived right in. <laughs> so I, I know it. we kind of started already talking about what is trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and you started describing all of that, but can you go a little bit more into detail? Cause I know there's also like some people think of traumas in different ways. And so when people are really thinking of how they have trauma kind of, can you describe a little bit more of what that may look like um, for different people? Yeah. There's so many different ways that somebody can experience trauma. And I talk about this in the class with the types of trauma and the layers of trauma And the types and the layers of trauma aren't really there to try to get you to group your trauma so that you're like, oh, if I have this type, I'm going to do this system, right? We're not really looking at it that way. It's more like when we understand kind of these types and these layers, we start to realize how prevalent trauma is. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about types, I'm usually talking about acute, something that happens very fast and chronic, something that is an ongoing thing. Acute traumas, you know car wrecks, sudden death of a loved one, um, you know, an unexpected attack, things like that could be classified as kind of an acute trauma, something that happens very suddenly. You could also categorize natural disasters into that category. Um, Whereas with chronic traumas, they tend to be things that go on for long periods of time. Like the most common that we think about are things like intimate partner violence or domestic violence, um, like child neglect, childhood neglect, that kind of thing. But we also have a lot of trauma that can come from systemic discrimination. And that's, especially here in the United States, that's a real issue where our systems are inherently built to favor certain people. Mm -hmm. And it's not... It's not that somebody is personally making the decision to favor. There are situations like that as well. But like the systems themselves were just built with certain 
beliefs in place that naturally favor certain people. And so if you are a person who is, you know, a person of color in the United States or women in the United States, there's a lot of systems that are built for men and not for women. Um, if you have disabilities, like there's all these different groups that kind of become marginalized. And so when you are faced with this systemic, um, I'll just call it systemic inequities. I don't know that that's quite the right word, but when you're faced with this day after day, it feels like the norm, but it can also be something that over time begins to overwhelm your nervous system and creates a sense of trauma. So there's a lot of different ways this can come into play. Um, the things that your parents experienced can, you know, epigenetically be passed down to you, but also the way they interact with you and attachment and things like that can be affected by their traumas. And of course, ancestral trauma coming through the epigenetics. So there's all these different ways that trauma can permeate your life and your existence and trauma. The best definition of trauma that I think I've ever heard was Trauma that we're talking about, this particular form of emotional trauma, is the body's reaction to an event that was perceived as overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So it's the body's reaction. It's not a choice somebody made. And the event was perceived as overwhelming. So I may perceive an event as overwhelming that you don't, right? Like, Nikki, you may not... You may not run into that. You may be like, oh, well, this is fine. But because of something in my past, all of a sudden, the same event becomes very overwhelming. And if I am not in a situation where I have a compassionate witness, I don't have tools in place that can help me to process to complete that stress cycle, well, then I can end up with trauma and it never even faced you to begin with. Yep. And that's something that I think is really important to recognize because some people can come out of the same situations and be you deeply scarred and somebody else comes out and goes, ah, oh, well, you know, just another Tuesday and goes on about their business. Um, so it's very prevalent. There's a lot of things that can hiccup and go wrong. Um, but at the same time, it's not, it's nobody's fault. And it's a very natural response. These are things that are set in our nervous system to help us to respond um, to threats, to danger, to keep us alive and keep us safe. So these different responses are very natural, but at the same time, once they start to, once they start to become like a regular trauma response after the event and it's happening in day-to-day -day life, somebody closes a door and you jump out of your skin, like those things are very uncomfortable and can begin to feel overwhelming. And that's where a lot of the stuff that we do with essential oils can become really helpful. Yeah. There so many tidbits that you've said there <laughs> that come to mind. Um, one thing is, I know you said in the U S um, very prevalent for a lot of things. I will say Canada's not that far behind either. Um, yeah. where we might be half a percent, slightly better, but not, not, not a whole lot. Um, especially we've had a lot of things with residential schools, um, that are, yeah. you know, so much, so many different things coming to light for, which is good that it's coming to light. Um, right. but a lot of generational trauma, absolutely. Um, coming down also that finally people are realizing right. that, you know, this is what has been happening for decades upon decades and upon decades. Right. Um, so, so, which is, as I said, good to come to the light at least. Right. Um, a lot of other things that you mentioned too, but one thing that had me thinking when you were talking about like that day to day and where some people they can brush it off other people it had a different impact on them and absolutely and this is where you know it's really important we don't judge someone else for what they're experiencing because their perception of something is absolutely what's key for themselves right. um you it's not your perception of what someone else's experience that's important it's their own perception now with the news and media being negative i feel like 98% of what is on the news is shootings and fires and natural disasters and different corruptions. And like, it's just negative after negative, after negative, after negative, it seems. Could that also cause a traumatic, like trauma in someone over time? I was having this discussion with someone a while ago, and it really made me think of, you know, if you're, 
if that's constantly being fed into you day after day, eventually that could almost change your your autonomic nervous system where then you're always on alert for those disasters, those negative impacts. What's happening out in society is always going to be this horrific event. It, no, that is a that is a really good point. There's a lot of things like that that can come into play. I was trying to look something up because I was going to, um, my long COVID sometimes makes me lose words. There is an idea in yoga um, and it's part of the, um, I think it's part of the Niyamas and I think it's Sausha. And I, I could be pronouncing that wrong. My Sanskrit's very poor. <laughs> um, but it, the idea of, purification right and of course from from the more traditional stance it's like eating foods that are pure and eating things but there's also reason to look at that when it comes to our media consumption and like what can we do to reduce the the um the trauma impact of media now there's a caveat to this because yes we don't want to get ourselves into a place where we are consuming so much negative media that we're starting to see it everywhere. Um, and I'm an, I was a 911 dispatcher for almost a decade and I have a really bad tendency to like to watch true crime. <laughs> I can tell you a lot about a lot of crazy, like true crime things like investigation discovery is one of my favorite channels, but I absorb that. And if I, if I do too much of it, you know, I can watch some and it's, you know, interesting and, and kind of, you know, that kind of investigative side of me likes it. But if I let it go too far, it will start to really affect my nervous system and I can, I can feel it happening. Um, and so there's that piece of it, but we also have to be careful not to use that as an excuse to not witness atrocities that are occurring in the world. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a balance, right? We have to, um, we have to allow ourselves the protection that we need in order for us to be able to function and to not re-traumatize ourselves and to not create this sense of like, this is just what the world is, right? Like you will mm -hmm. lose sight of the good. I think Mr. Rogers is the one that said like, look for the helpers, you know, yeah. you'll lose sight of the good if you get hyper-focused on the media and in the same sentence, if you start to ignore the things that are occurring around you that are bad, you risk like you risk burying yourself in your privilege of somebody who doesn't have to deal with this. Yeah. And so there's a balance to be had. And I encourage people, if you're listening to this and you struggle with the media, are there other sources of media that you can find that will help to keep you um, informed about what's going on, but it's not quite as, um, the word is gone. It's not quite as um, vivid. Salacious is not the word, but it's kind of like that. Like yeah. the, the, like there are news sources that play to that emotive side, right? They play towards that, having you feel like really strongly about something. Mm -hmm. And then there's news sources that help to just kind of tell you what's occurring without trying to play in and, and like play on your emotions. Yeah. And so finding sources like that, if you're finding yourself really struggling with the more emotive, the more common sources that are out there could be a way to kind of combat that while still allowing yourself to be informed about the things that people are dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. That was great. <laughs> it was just something like a discussion that came up a while ago and it really made me think too of, you know, it, it can cause, there's so many things yeah. out there and, you know, again, just to reiterate, it's, it's your perception of what is going on. That right. is key. Um, no one else can, can make that perception or make that right. judgment for someone. Um, oh, yeah. so absolutely. And I, I struggle with that with the 911 dispatch and shootings and things like that. Like there were a couple mm -hmm. of very traumatizing shootings and bless my poor therapist because she tried really hard. Like, well, you know, the shootings are, are common here, but you know, the likelihood of you having to deal with one is very low. Well, then I dealt with one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, and so I struggle with that. I struggle with the shootings and, and like, when I go somewhere, if I hear a loud noise, it's immediately like, where did that come from? Do I need to be ducking and running kind of thing? So everybody, you know, your background, 
your experience is going to inform the things that might bother you. So somebody that goes out with me who doesn't have a 911 dispatch background, who didn't go through the same thing I went through, may not have that same response. Um, but they may also, you know, maybe they have a, a house fire in their background. And so fire bothers them more than it does me or whatever it might be. There's all these yeah. different things. Um, and so there's kind of a have compassion towards others as well as having compassion towards yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and you funny you mentioned the fire because I did have a house fire and it probably took months for me to hear a fire engine again and not mm -hmm. instantly panic. Yeah. And I was working um, feet on the street at the time with um, unhoused people. And it was so and we were right in the core of, of my city where there's fire stations like there's fire trucks constantly. Yeah. So yeah. working, it would be like three, four times a day where I'd have to like just stop and remind myself like, no, I'm good. I'm not home. <laughs> my house is not on fire at the moment. Right. Right. And we're good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it probably like it, it took me a few months and then I was able to kind of retrain my mind, retrain my body of, you know, when I hear this fire truck, I know we're all good and we're all safe and yes. everything's good to go. Exactly. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You, you're hitting a good point there. There is rewiring that can be done. Yeah. You can retrain your brain. You can rewire your nervous system. There is hope. It's not like, oh, it's the end of the world. Nothing's ever going to be better. Um, there are ways to do that. And so absolutely, like, I think that's an important thing to recognize as well. Cause I get real spun up on, well, here's where this could go wrong and here's where this could go wrong. And like, but there is also hope like there, yes. th because we know what's kind of going wrong, we can then like reverse that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and this just made me think too. So can you talk a little bit about what does happen? Cause we often hear about like the, the flight. Wow. I'm, I'm losing my thoughts now. Um, flight, freeze, mm -hmm. um, all of that aspect of it. Fight, right. fight, flight, and freeze. There we go. I've got the apps. <laughs> um, and kind of, because I mean, we've all heard of that. And back in the day, it was always, you know, there's a bear, there's a tiger, things like that were always a thing. Whereas right. now it's not, those aren't the cases anymore. We've talked right. about a lot of the situations that can cause that, but can you, so what happens in the body a little bit more yeah. um, for that? So when you first, when you're first alert to a danger, there's something that's called the, the freeze orient response. A lot of people, when they first hear danger, they'll kind of freeze up. And that's not the, that's a little bit different from like the trauma freeze response, right? But there's just mm -hmm. a moment where you stop and you look around, right? And if you see something and you're like, oh, like, okay, I thought I heard somebody breaking and entering, but it's just my cat rattling the doorknob, you know, like then, okay, I'm good. And, yeah, yeah. and your body kind of goes back and, and things can go on as normal. But if that is somebody at the door, right, then your body can kind of become, um, it goes through the sympathetic response first, which is your fight or flight. There's a lot of energy. You're trying to decide, do I move towards the threat? Do I run away from the threat? you know, is there something I can be doing about this situation? Sometimes that's all that we do. The situation resolves, we go back, right? Mm -hmm. Other times we realize we can't do anything and we actually go into what's called the dorsal vagal collapse or shutdown. The body starts to conserve energy. Um, we may go numb. We may kind of dissociate where we're not really feeling anything. We're not really like we're just doing the movement. Um, or in some cases, not doing any movement and actually physically collapsing. Like there are times where that happens. And if the, if the stress cycle goes the way that like for it to complete, right, you're going to go back through some of the uh, sympathetic fight or flight responses. So once that numbness starts to wear off, you may get real irritable, you may start shaking, you may need to run, whatever that might be. And then if the stress cycle completes the way it's supposed to, then you'll just kind of go back to baseline and things will be back to normal. What occurs when we are in a situation that proceeds to cause trauma for us, somewhere up at the top of that curve, whether it's in the fight or flight sympathetic section, or if it's in the dorsal vagal collapse and shut down somewhere we get stuck. Now this could either be that we're going through this danger and then all of a sudden something worse comes along and creates another stress cycle before that one can complete. 
sometimes it's as simple as you're in a meeting, your boss has said something that's really like, maybe they've been really ugly to you in front of other people, but you can't leave the meeting and go run that energy off. You can't go, you know, like allow yourself to cry in the bathroom because crying can be part of like finishing that cycle, right? You have to sit there and you have to take it. And that can actually stop the stress cycle from completing. And so if you don't consciously try to to complete the stress cycle later, that can actually add to that trauma load. Or it could be something like you're in a dangerous situation and you have offspring you have to take care of in that moment. So maybe you have children or you have, you know, a a friend that you have to, you know, like somebody in that moment you've got to take care of and you don't have time to tend to your own nervous system in that moment. Mm -hmm. The idea of putting your oxygen mask on before you put your child on is great in theory, but it doesn't always play out in the real world. Yeah. I would love for that to be the case, but it doesn't always play out that way. So there are situations in which in order to get out of danger or in order to handle something, you may be tending to somebody else And you don't have time to complete that stress cycle for yourself. I mean, there are other examples, but those are kind of the big ones, right? And in those moments, the body does not have a chance to move the experience from what's happening right now into memory. So what happens is then it stays in the it's happening now. It's dangerous right now. It doesn't move into, wow, that happened to me in the past. And what you're talking about with with the the fire trucks, right? For those, you know, seven or eight months, your body kept saying, this is happening now. Your nervous system was saying, this is danger now. And then you were able to work with it and turn it into, okay, this is a memory of something that was awful. I'm not forgetting it. I'm not ignoring that it occurred. But my nervous system is no longer trying to process it as a current threat. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, thank you for that. And yeah. and honestly, it, I don't know why it brought me back to uh, my time working in schools too. Of I just always remember, right, when you have all the kids lined up and to go out of the class for whatever reason, and there's always little Johnny, and sorry for any Johns out there listening, but little Johnny um, who someone walks by and just knocks him, but he's the one who'll turn around and push back and, and he's the one with the behaviors and he's the one with this and he's the one he does. He's always, you know, up to something. And to me, I remember when I was learning about all this originally, I was like, this totally makes sense. Like he's, it's his, he goes into fight mode because he feels he's in danger and it isn't always, it's not something that he's consciously choosing to do necessarily. um, But it is his gut reaction right. to just do something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just when you were talking, it brought me back to that memory of that light bulb going off in a way of how I could help support those kids a little bit more and help teachers understand a little bit more of what's going on with students who are like this too. Exactly. Um, because yeah, it isn't always something that's obvious when right. someone's having that fight, flight, freeze reactions. It's not something that you can just stop and be like, oh, I was in a fight mode. I was in a freeze mode. <laughs> right. No, it's true. And and it helps us, for me, the more that I've learned about it, the more I've had compassion for others around me, but also for myself. Like mm-hmm. there's there's been several times where I've been like, oh, okay, that explains why I had this response. You know, well, why didn't I fight back in this situation? Well, because my body went into that collapse, that dorsal vagal state. Yeah. That just caused me to say, okay, this is where I have to be right now. Shut down, you yeah. know, and why didn't I do this? Or why did I snap at this person? Well, it was a fight or flight response. It was that, you know, and you can start to kind of see, and because you begin to see what's happening, you can start catching it earlier in the cycle. You can start catching it earlier as it begins to come on and you can be like, Ooh, I'm feeling a lot of fight in my system right now. Let me go get the essential oils that help with this. Let me use my little inhaler and just, okay, I'm okay. You know, and a lot of the times that can help settle the nervous system to where you don't go into that state of overwhelm where you're reacting in a way that could be damaging to you or people around you. It could be, you know, perpetuating, you know, trauma for other people. Like that's where it really starts to become helpful, becoming aware 
of these reactions your nervous system is having and then starting to realize kind of what those early signs are, backing it up and checking those early signs and then doing interventions, essential oils, maybe a tea, maybe breathing exercises, maybe you do a yoga flow, you know, depending on where you are and what you have available, having these different tools, especially a lot of these natural tools can help to give you an, it can stretch the reaction. It can stretch the response so that you have time to decide how you're going to respond yep. instead of just falling straight into that nervous system reaction. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and it is, there's, it's always easy to look back at a situation and say, what if, why didn't I, it, it, it's always easier to do that. But like right. you said, it's, it's hold, hold space for yourself, have some compassion for yourself. Um, and look at it if you can, at, at, at one point when you can look at it as a teaching moment for yourself, right. um, to then see, okay, so this is what I may try next time. And if a situation next time comes up, see how, if, if, you know, if it's something that comes to mind of doing it, you're able to take that pause before going up to that next level with your nervous system, then great. Um, if not, then again, show yourself some self-compassion and try again next time. Like there's never, yeah. it, it, it's not a, a needs to do right now. It's a work in progress. We're all work in progress. We're always going to be work in progress for the rest of our lives because we're always evolving, always shifting, always learning. And hopefully we try and improve what we can about ourselves day to day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It is something that, you know, um, what I run into with my clients is once they have a knowledge of what is happening, then they get very frustrated. Well, why can't I stop this? Cause it takes time. It takes time to start catching it earlier and earlier in the right? cycle. Like you can't just immediately you're accustomed to noticing when it's bursting out, right? You're accustomed to noticing the big explosive display, right? Like a firework. The thing that you notice first is the big explosions, the big lights in the sky. But if you have, heard a couple of fireworks, you can start to recognize that little whistle that occurs before something pops, right? Well, yeah. now you're catching the whistle and you're slowing it down there instead of trying to contain the explosion that's happening. Yeah. I love that. Uh, the fireworks. That's, that's a great way of looking at it. Absolutely. I literally just came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah. And, and I, I remember I used to be on different events, um, try and do little check-ins throughout the day with myself. Yes. Like, okay, where am I at? Yes. Um, you know, zero to 10, where is, how, how is my nervous system feeling right now? Absolutely. Like legit. And especially when my kids were a lot younger, I didn't do that enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it's, you know, so you get in these hard situations and you just become tapped out. And like you said, boom, fireworks go off. Um, right. So it is, it's being, if I have, I have found since then of checking in periodically throughout the day of like, okay. And when I see I'm like, okay, no, like I'm at a five out of 10 all of a sudden, like, okay, like you said, let's do a few things to bring myself maybe back down to a three out of 10, um, right. different things like that to help before I get to those explosions, right. which one of those things, like you said, um, and what we're going to talk about are essential oils. Yes. So <laughs> what, uh, when people are going through whatever kind of trauma they're going through, um, what kind of of essential oils do you typically, and I know it's going to be different for everybody, um, really depending on what they like. Yes. I always say is the biggest thing. Um, but I would love your input on what kind of essential oils you typically reach for maybe, um, when you're supporting people through trauma. Yeah. So as, um, those of you who have ever listened to me talk about this, I will talk about the polyvagal theory a lot. And for the sake of time, I know we've, we've gone through a lot of material, um, but essentially these different states, right? The fight or flight state and the collapse and shutdown state, which also can sometimes involve freeze. Freeze can be a little more complicated, but generally speaking, you have those two responses. Either there's a lot of energy building up the fight or flight. I need to move towards things. I need to make things happen. And that's very much that, that uh, like bringing in more energy fight or flight state. Or you have this collapse, this shutdown, the energy is leaving the system, you're going numb, you're feeling cold, like you can't really move, that's collapse and shutdown. Mm -hmm. For most people, 
essential oils are going to work based off of which of those states they're experiencing. There's a lot of nuance to this. But if you're really starting to try to find something, if you are in that fight or flight, like lots of energy state, you want to find things that help you to feel like you're um, you're kind of able to drain some of the energy off, try to unwind a little bit and allow that level to come down some. So I always think of like the florals, right? Um, mm-hmm. Lavender kind of palmarosa bergamot can kind of sit in that category too though bergamot can also you know there's other things but um you know you having those kind of like soothing relaxing type of essential oils that really help to signal to the nervous system like hey like we're at a place where we are safe enough mm-hmm. to go from that five to that three when we have a dorsal vagal collapse and shutdown um those oils tend to the things that tend to help most people in that situation tend to be things that are a little bit more supportive and energizing. So for me, that tends to, I tend to talk a lot about the um, like sweet orange, some of the citrus, the things that have delimiting in it, which is why I said bergamot can kind of, kind of straddle the fence. Yeah. depending, right? but, <laughs> but like, like where the, you've got like your Mandarin and things like that, that kind of falls into that category some of the woodsy scents can also kind of be that supportive and slightly energizing um, feel. And so those oils are where I start with somebody who is in that kind of dorsal vagal collapse and shutdown state. Now, I will say what you said about what people like is really important key to this, mm-hmm. right? Because there's several oils that fit either of those categories, right? And so what we have to then do is say, okay, what are the scents that I like? What are the scents that make me feel connected, calm, safe, whatever those sensations are that you're wanting to feel? And how do, do, do they match kind of what I'm like, which ones fit into that category based off of what I am experiencing at this moment? Yeah. Not what I experienced when the trauma happened, not what I experienced two years ago when I thought about this last time, what I am experiencing right now in this moment And then from there, you can usually come up with, you know, two or three essential oils or maybe one specific one, but you could do little blends and things like that, kind of depending on, you know, what your interests are. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And, um, yeah, when you're talking about, I was like, where are the woods? Where are the, cause those are my, those are my go-tos, um, the vetiver, the cedar, witch, and I'm very vocal about that. Those are, I, I love the grounding ones because they yeah. bring me back to happy places. Um, yeah. And they and, they do. They literally ground me back. Yeah. And I feel like I'm starting to float away. I'm just like, whew, come right, right back down. Yeah. There's amazing options like that. And then I will say that what you run into sometimes with the woodsy ones is that a lot of colognes are mm-hmm. based off of that kind of stuff. And so if something smells particularly like an attacker's cologne, you may have to yes. stay away from that. Absolutely. But there are other options like cedar and pine are not identical. Right. So like you could use or vetivers, you know, sandalwood, like there's all I really love those really kind of heady scents. Yeah. Um, it, it just, just for me, they're just they're great. And but like if you smell something, you think, oh, my gosh, that reminds me of, you know, whatever, then pick something else in that family and try that instead, because there's yeah. so many different options out there. And it's not a matter of pushing through with something that you don't love. It's about finding the things that you really like. And like for you, that's the woodsy sense. Yeah. 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 And I think that what you've made really great points there is, you know, our olfactory system is so strong and sensitive and our scent memory is, is huge. And there are so many options out there. So if you do have, if there is an aroma, a certain oil that brings you back to a memory that is not something you want to have, then absolutely pick something else. There's so many options out there. Don't be afraid to see what else might be, you know, a a distant cousin to that oil. (laughs) Exactly. And, And this is where like, getting with a clinical aromatherapist can help for those of you Mm -hmm. who maybe aren't clinical aromatherapists yourself, like find somebody in your area or find somebody that you trust, you know, maybe talk to Nikki. Right. And, and 
get with them and say, Hey, like I want this scent family, but here are the reasons why I can't use this one. Or I'm interested in creating a blend out of these oils. Can you help me? You know, like you can do that kind of thing. And, and, you know, different people will do consultations differently, Mm. but like consult with people who have the clinical experience, consult with people who have been through the programs, understand the underlying constituents of these different oils and can get you something that's similar, but maybe doesn't have quite the same smell or whatever it might be to, to, it, it's just easier than trying to buy a bunch of stuff yourself and play with it and try to figure it out. Like I really, like it could get expensive yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah. <it can. laughs> and especially when you then buy an oil and you're like, Oh, I don't like the smell of that. Right, um, right. It gets, the, then you've just wasted. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And now do you have a preferred way of using oils when yes. you're working with this? Absolutely. Most of the time I do inhalation. Yes. Um, if I am working with somebody, I, I really, I hate that I didn't think to bring one of the little um, personal inhalers. I, don't, I down moved in away my, from my desk. And so I don't usually, oh. I usually have like a bunch in my desk also to show and I'm at a different desk right now. Oh, so no. yeah, I don't even have one either. I'm looking around. I'm like, no. Yeah, mine's down in my lair. Like I don't have any up here, but like it, they look like little lipstick tubes. Yeah. And there's usually a little glass vial inside of, of them. And that's where the essential oils are is in a little glass vial. And you usually use like a little cotton wick. Um, and that keeps the oils kind of contained and you just pop the lid off the little tube and, you know, inhale and you're getting some of the benefits from the essential oils. Um, I like this method because like, you know, there's concerns about certain oils with different animals. There's, concerns with certain oils around children. If you happen to be around other people who also have struggled with different types of trauma, you know, and their scent memory connection is different. Like, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that that can come into play. So for me, the inhalers are the best option for most people. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have like really severe asthma, or if you have other breathing issues that, you know, are, are particularly sensitive, then instead of just being like, well, Elizabeth said, I can go do this. Like that would be a time to talk with a clinical aromatherapist and make sure that whatever you're using is going to be safe. And you might end up switching to a topical application. Um, And again, clinical aromatherapists can help with safe dilutions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And when, when you're doing topical applications, you may not be getting as much of the scent memory connection, but still those constituents, the, the beneficial properties of the different essential oils are going to be absorbing into your skin and getting into your bloodstream. And the, those chemicals, the ones that we've studied that we understand a little bit about now, a lot of those chemicals can signal to your autonomic nervous system, that part of your nervous system that is uh, the dealing with these reactions and these responses. It can signal to that nervous system that things are a little bit safer than what we thought. You know, we can come down again from that five to that three. So you don't have to do the inhalation in order to get the benefits. But for me, because of that scent memory connection, that is by far the way that I prefer to use oils. Yeah. I love doing the, the inhalers and adding, um, when I can, I also try and go one step further and add a visualization with it too. a visualizing myself, calming down, visualizing, you know, whatever it is that in that moment feels good to right. help because then I've got the two things combined together, right. which always, I, I love visualizing different things. I do it a lot during my guided meditations, different things that I'm doing. Um, so for me, you know, the more we can combine without getting right. overwhelmed though, um, right. I, I find it, it's beneficial. And, yeah, and for my yoga work, um, my stuff tends to be the inhalers and um, pranayama or breath work. Mm-hmm. So different breath yeah. techniques that help to signal to the nervous system, like, hey, we're in a place that's okay. And, yeah. and that d- varies from person to person, but things like square breathing can be really mm-hmm. helpful to learn. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Breathing practices are another huge one too that I love. Yeah. Um, and the other thing too, is when you were talking about the topical application and we tell our students this all the time, less is more, less is more. Uh, you don't even need like 3%, 2%. A lot of times when I'm working 
for uh, emotional support, uh, that aspect of it, you know, a 0.5, a 1% is typically my go-to. There's no need to have typically even a 2%. Um, and 2% is my, my go-to to start for, you know, pain, um, maybe some kind of skin condition things like right. that. But when I'm talking, when, when I'm supporting someone emotionally with anything, that's not a physical thing we can see in our body right then and there, it'll be that smaller percent, even more so um, exactly. because the energies of the essential oils are just as powerful as a, the therapeutic actions um, that are involved too. Yeah. And if you've got the right blends, um, a lot of the times you don't need, if you've got the right blend, the nervous system is already like hyperactive in these moments. The nervous mm -hmm. system is already searching for input. So you don't have to have very much of it for the nervous system to receive that input and go, oh, okay. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that is, so yeah, definitely. And the way that I teach it is one, like a half to 1%. Okay, great. Happy we're on the same page with that. <laughs> Yeah. And the other thing you said real quick too, is, you know, the nervous system's looking, it doesn't take much to bring it down, right. but it also doesn't take much to bring it back up. And this right. is where when people are diffusing and they're diffusing for five hours straight, this is, can get your nervous system whew, right yep. back up. And mm -hmm. then you feel, and then people start wondering like, why am I agitated again? Why, like, why, why is yeah. everything feeling ugh, and they just right. can't calm down again? Like you have just bum bombarded your nervous system nonstop, not letting it breathe. Right. So yep. it's, it, there, there's that difference between, you know, you just need a little bit and that's where those personal inhalers are nice to take three deep breaths. Or if you are going to diffuse, you know, diffuse for 30 minutes. Um, right. and again, also depending if there's kids, pets, all of that jazz, yeah, but if you're home by caveats, yourself, but... <laughs> diffusing, you know, diffuse 30 minutes, 60 minutes max. Um, right. and, and then take at least that 60 minute break is always what I say. Um, because some people, they, they forget the personal inhalers, which I get, um, right. and they prefer the diffusing. So yeah, just, so if you're going to do that, just make sure you aren't letting it run all day, thinking right. that's going to help you all day because it'll that's have the rebound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been a really, really great conversation. Um, before we chime off, I'd like to know if you have any other parting words you would like to share with our listeners. Oh, there's so many things that could be said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is that there are options. If one thing hasn't worked, you can pivot to something else. There are so many different scents that are available and there's so many different ways that you can work with this to find something that will help start that rewiring process for your nervous system. And this is not going to be done in a vacuum. Um, you know, this is a lot of these things can be really helpful but they're going to be even more effective when we start working to rebuild communities and to get to the point where you could go to your neighbor and ask for an egg and not feel weird about knocking on their door and being like, I'm short one egg. Can I have, you know, like right. we need to get back to that point. So yeah. on top of what you're doing for yourself personally, if you're able to find ways to interact with communities and become part of, you know, you don't have to be bosom buddies with everybody. I'm not suggesting that, but like learning ways to connect with people and to help each other and to um, serve each other in a lot of ways. Like if we began to do that, then a lot of these traumas would not be so severe. And eventually we would not have several of the traumas that we have now. Um, there's this visualization. I do not remember where I first heard it. But somebody was saying that there were two tables and people had kind of spoons strapped to their arms to eat soup, but the spoons were too long and like they couldn't move their arms for them to eat soup. And at one table, everybody's like trying to like toss soup and, you know, they can't <laughs> eat it because it's like just like pouring down their faces. They're trying to feed themselves. It's not working. Why is this not working? At the other table, everybody started feeding each other. Mm -hmm. and everybody ate and was full. And of course, again, and this is a perfect world, right? Like obviously that's not 
everything that happens here. But there are moments where if we choose to feed each other, to support each other, then we are building a space in which these conversations won't be as necessary. My work, I would be happy if in 15, 20 years, my work didn't exist anymore, you know? (laughs) I used to say that all the time. I'm like, I wish I could work myself out of a job. I honestly would. When I was working in the school system, as a kind, I was like, I wish I could work myself out of a job. It would be the best day of my life. Yep. Um, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. If people do want to connect with you, um, if they want to possibly join your your aroma therapy, um, mm-hmm. your trauma, uh, wow, the your course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or trauma and aroma therapy, or connect with you in any which way, how can people find you? So my website is www.traumainformedherbalist.com. I'm on most of the social medias under trauma-informed herbal or trauma-informed herbalist, kind of depending on the site. And my books are available anywhere. So you can buy them from my website. Uh, If you don't mind the wait time, my website's nice because then I get a little bit more from them. But if you need to go to Amazon or something like that, they are available there as well. So I have both the trauma-informed herbalist and essential oils for trauma. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll have all that information also in the show notes so people can easily access them, find you, uh, and and all of that in the future. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, uh, we really appreciate it. Great conversation. I could continue talking to you for hours, honestly. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Hope everyone has a fantastic day. Nikki here with Elizabeth. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thank you for spending your time with us here at Vetiver Vibes. This episode was brought to you by Accentria, a leading online aromatherapy school. Don't forget to check out some of our free resources at www.schoolofacentria.com. If you love this episode or you got a lot of value out of it, please make sure you share it with someone in your community who you think would enjoy it too. If you haven't already subscribed or reviewed the show yet, you can go on over to your preferred streaming platform and hit subscribe, then leave a review. This is the best way to help support us and we appreciate it. Email us with a screenshot of your review and we will send you a free guided meditation as our way to say thank you. This podcast is for information purposes only. We are certified clinical aromatherapists and holistic health professionals. If you have a medication concern, please refer to your health team. Everyone's health is unique to themselves, so the topics and suggestions stated may or may not apply directly to you.